excited to be really just connecting and you know talking a little bit more about this in-depth subject. So as Celeste said, we're really gonna be going through some of the key factors today when it comes to understanding how hormones actually affect the skin. And what are some of these physical manifestations that we might see as skin therapists? So there are ways that we see this kind of shifting in both men and women throughout our lives. And we have to deal with these effects, whether it is puberty, um, pregnancy, perimenopause, menopause, these fluctuating hormones are really responsible for everything from breakouts to hyperpigmentation, to dryness, to aging. That is definitely a key component of it. So for us as skin therapists, we just need to be prepared to, you know, how can we address maybe some of these changes that we see on our client's skin as they start to mature? And understanding that if we see things such as like dryness or flakiness or some hormonal breakout, I'm not sure if any of you have experienced that in your lifetime, um, but I know I have. And it's sometimes frustrating, right? For clients to under not really understand like why am I experiencing these things at maybe a, such a late age in life? So we're gonna be taking a journey today through the body and really various hormones that can affect the skin during some key phases um, of our life. So let's get started. So first and foremost, we want to know that the journey begins with the endocrine system. So you know, and generally, this system is charge of, in charge of a lot of body processes that happen slowly. Like for example, cell growth would be a great example of that way. Now, like faster breathing processes and body movement, that's of course your nervous system. But even though these are like separate systems, they actually can communicate to each other. So what I want you to do is really take a look at this slide here. And this kind of just gives you a general like overview of really some of the key endocrine glands, which are really a very special group that make hormones. So the major ones are going to be like the pituitary, the pineal, the thymus, um, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, and the pancreas that are pictured here. So in addition, we also want to think about sex hormones, right? It's what we call sex steroid hormones. And these, of course, are produced by the testes in men and the ovaries in women. So the thing when you take a look at this, this is a very complex process. And of course, all of it starts right here in the brain. So it's really governed. These um, endocrine glands are really governed by signals that start in the brain. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now, what I want you to know about this is that it really only takes a tiny, tiny amount of a hormone to be disrupted to cause a lot of change. And what I mean by that is if you have too much of a certain hormone or too little, there's definitely some significant changes that you're going to see kind of appear on the skin. Now, you also might be looking at this slide thinking, okay, wait a second, there is another um, kind of area there that talks about it being uh, available during pregnancy and that is the placenta. So for those of you who joined me for my Pregnancy in the Skin webinar, you may remember me talking about this in quite depth, but during pregnancy, there is what we call, or basically science calls, a temporary organ, and that's the placenta. So once it's developed, you know, it's well-developed, right, and it's taking care of the fetus, the placenta actually begins to control progesterone and estrogen. So, you know, studies show that it's definitely really rich in like these sphingolipids, which when they are activated, they can upregulate melanogenesis. And we know that, you know, melanogenesis definitely has some key enzymes that affect it, like tyrosinase, for example. And if you see an increase in tyrosinase, which definitely can happen from the activity of the placenta, there would be an increase in melanin synthesis. So it starts to kind of, if you think about that, it kind of makes sense when we start to see pigmentation changes 
during our, our pregnant client's skin. So think about melasma or chalasma, that mask of pregnancy. We know that all of this is, can, can actually be, be kind of connected to the temporary organ known as, as the placenta. Now, of course, when the baby's born, then that's no longer there. So that's why you see some women, the melasma in, uh, improves. And for other women, it, it may linger a little bit longer because everyone's just definitely an individual when it comes to how they respond to that. So I just really wanted to share with you some of that interesting science behind that. Now, the skin is not just a target of these hormones. I'm actually, it can be considered it's an endocrine organ on its own. So it has numerous kind of receptors um, that actually seek out these different messages from the endocrine and nervous and immune system. There's a lot more research that's ongoing here, but it definitely plays a big role in how it can actually secrete its own hormones as well. So when we think of hormones, what, what are they, right? <laughs> what do they do for the, for the body and for the skin? So basically, you know, in a very kind of layman's terms, hormones are your body's chemical messengers. They travel in your bloodstream to all your tissues and organs. But the thing is they do work slowly over time. So they are really responsible for key processes during our development and growth. And that's actually listed there for you on the slide, right? They affect our growth and development. We have hormones that tell us to grow or grow up, right? Thinking of us as small children as we move into adults. There are hormones that tell us to stop growing as well. They're controlled with that. Um, hormones control metabolism, hormones that control obviously sexual functions from puberty all the way up into adult life. Uh, reproduction is actually controlled by steroid hormones and even our mood. So I'm gonna ask you guys a question and you can just pop it right there in the, ch in the chat box. Have you ever been affected, your mood has been affected at any time? For example, being really like, um, angry or maybe you have like a young adult um, living with you or a teenager, um, mood swings kind of changing in those teenage years. I'd love to hear, just give me like, yes, for sure. I definitely have had that happen. I know when my, uh, my son was younger, I mean, I call it the teenage years of angst and it was always a, a mood changing um, that can happen. So think of like surges of like being like really like agitated or even surges of like crying um, for no apparent reason. So let me know if you've definitely experienced that as well. Cause I think one of the things that we know is that in these different changes of life, we're going to see a lot of these different things happen as far as growth, development, um, reproduction, but mood. So these are just a few. So if you think about hormones, they um, are very powerful. They control everything from waking to sleeping and for women, our reproductive cycle. And it just also, they control how we age and our mood. So yes, I see a lot of people saying, yes, definitely does. <laughs> I have two, yes, with my two brothers. I know, I mean, it's just amazing. So now that we have a little bit more of an intuition to the fact of, wait, what's going on? I was one day great and the next day is not. It's, it's pretty powerful how these surges can affect us on our day-to-day -day life. So what I wanna show you here is actually just to kind of tap into how powerful these hormones are. This is just a brief image where actually we dive into this deeper into our skin series, um, hormones in the, in the skin course, which is much longer and more in depth. But this is just an image that shows what's called steroidogenesis or how steroid hormones are converted and produced. Now you'll see here, you're probably looking at this thinking like, oh my gosh, this is a lot going on. But what I want you to notice is that right there at the top, it all starts with cholesterol. And so when we think about the word, the word steroid, it actually you know, encompasses the hormones really derived from this cholesterol molecule. Now they can be grouped into basically five groups. And again, we get into this a little bit deeper um, into 
our skin series course, but progesterones, um, androgens are going to be another group you can see highlighted there in circle, um, estrogens, uh, glucocorticoids, mineral uh, corticoids, and progesterones. So what we're going to be really focusing on today is more of that estrogenic and that androgenic effect. So some from our estrogens and from our progesterones. Um, and you'll see this is really complex. So it's no wonder that our clients can get really kind of frustrated, especially if they are like in their 40s um, and having breakout as if they were 16. And so when we see this happen, you can see it's very potent. It's very complex. We can't control our hormones um, or control our clients' hormones as skin therapists, but we can definitely help them manage their skin. So let's uh, first take a look at steroid hormones. So this is primarily, as I mentioned, made in uh, testes in men and ovaries in women and adrenal glands in both of the sexes. So as far as we know, right, steroid hormones are derived or made from the cholesterol molecule. And that's what science is telling us right now, but there's always research out there happening. These steroid hormones, why it's key for us to know is this is such a powerful hormone group that it controls metabolism, our immune function, inflammation or swelling in our body, even our salt and water balance. If you've thought about this, where you've maybe felt, felt uh, swelling around your hands, around like your rings feel tight, or maybe you've had a, on a pair of shoes and they kind of have felt tight like around your feet, there's definitely um, hormones that are controlling that type of swelling and inflammation and our salt and water balance. And of course, our sexual characteristics. And yes, these steroid hormones are in basically and responsible for how stress starts to really affect us. So we want to today really take a look at androgens and estrogen and uh, progesterone and take a look at how they affect on the skin. But, you know, just an overall look at this list, you can probably well agree with me that this is quite a bit of influence that these hormones have on our day-to-day -day life. So let's start with the androgenic effects. So the biggest difference between really male and female skin is due to these male sex hormones called um, basically collectively known as androgens. So now the chief sex hormone of all this, of course, is testosterone. And yes, it's uh, primarily secreted in the testes um, and the ovaries. So yes, actually women do produce it too but not to the extent as men. Men actually can um, produce about 10 times more testosterone than um, women. So it also is going to kind of, as what I call it, exert its effects by basically acting upon androgen receptors throughout the body. And it does this by directly, um, affecting it, or it can get converted into dihydrotestosterone. So for those of you who remember taking some of our acne courses, we talk a lot about how this like potent androgen can get converted into dihydrotestosterone and then gets activated on by a 5-alpha reductase. So in the skin series course, we really kind of dive into that nitty gritty for you. But if you think about that, that also starts affecting the way sebum production happens, that whole conversion. So what are some of the things that we might see physically, right? On, um, especially in a male skin, but and to some extent for women as well. So areas that are really sensitive um, are going to be, think about face, um, underarms, genital areas. They're really going to, actually the testosterone is going to trigger that production of what we call terminal hair. So body hair. So think about beards, um, chest hair, um, even just thicker kind of coarser hair on the body um, in different varying regions. So it, it really extends for men to even to like the arms, even the legs, pretty much um, anywhere on the body, even the back. So the androgens also can control hair growth much I'd say to like a lesser extent in women. 
So it's really, you know, interesting when you take a look at this, of course, you're probably thinking, yes, of course, Beth, the first obvious thing I noticed um, on a on a gentleman is that he has coarser, darker hair. If you think like beard hair or like a uh, hair that's on the chest. Um, but there's also an interesting point is that because of this higher level of testosterone in the body, their makeup on the face is a little bit different. There's denser collagen and elastin network. Um, they have these like more stronger linked fibers and let's say um, a, a woman's skin because of the conversion or androgens being acted, um, acting on the skin directly, there's also a little bit more of a like increased sebum production and oil production. But what I also think is really interesting is that this effect actually can cause a level of increased sensitivity and, and men especially, because remember they're making about 10 times as much as women. And what we see on that end is you may have male clients who maybe flush a little bit easier when it comes to uh, their skin treatments. Maybe the steam causes a little bit more rosiness in the skin. You also may see them being more prone to kind of sensitive um, areas or like more inf inflammation effects, um, like maybe psoriasis. And you also, we'll see that they have a little bit more of a slower wound healing due to this amount of kind of androgens and testosterone, testosterone um, in the body. So something to be aware of. So if you're thinking, wow, I you know, expected one of my male clients, like they have thicker skin, they have more sebum, right? They don't show signs of aging as quickly. I feel like their skin could be a little bit more more like tougher, right? Like you could do more with it. You could do that chemical peel um, as deeply as you needed to, but just be cautious because some men, depending on their levels may be a little bit more sensitive. So you can definitely tap into that sensitive side by just really taking a look at understanding and watching that skin as you perform those treatments. So don't be, you know, misled thinking that a man's, a man's skin is, even if it's a little thicker, that it's tougher. You really still want to be cautious. So really interesting. Yes, definitely. I can see some people comments being like, never thought about that before. Again, hormones, very, very powerful. Okay. Let's move into estrogen, right? So this is, um, for all of the, uh, all of us tuning in today, this is probably the area that we get like the most questions. Um, I think, especially when it comes to how these types of estrogens or estrogen levels for women definitely change through our life. So the word estrogen encompasses a group of basically similar hormones. So there's three I want you to be no to know about. Um, there's estradiol, which is basically the most abundant form of estrogen in adult females. There's estriol, which is the primary estrogen that is going to be um, present during pregnancy. And then there's estrum, which is the primary estrogen during menopause. And we'll talk a little bit about perimenopause and menopause today as well. So estrogens basically are kind of made by this kind of conversion. So you remember that whole slide I showed you on steroidogenesis, there's a whole another type of level of how um, this like estrogens basically get converted in the body and in the skin. But just as the skin can produce cholesterol and you know androgens, the skin can also produce estrogens. So the science is really out there and it's, it's really interesting. Now, what why I guess I, I guess I should say why is it so important, right? That we have these like maintained balanced levels of estrogen in our skin. So estrogens can actually maintain hydration. They can increase glycosamine and glycans. So think about hyaluronic acid, for example, really giving that nice hydrated plump buoyancy to the skin. They can also um, increase collagen production which is very key. And it's interesting, the two that are linked, as we start to age, right, our collagen production starts to deplete and our estrogen levels also start to get lower. 
Um, so when they are there to help really increase this collagen production, that's where they can maintain that epidermal thickness, right? Where we definitely see that um, nice firm tone taut skin especially like in our like late teenage years and in, in our 20s. Now, besides improving like our collagen production um, as, and also to hydration in the skin, estrogens can actually kind of increase what's known as uh, vascularization. And basically it just allows for proper blood flow um, through capillaries. So that blood flow delivering, right? All that amazing nutrients and oxygen right to the skin as it's needed. Now I've listed here increase in, in pigmentation. So I would say the effects of pigmentation by estrogen specifically are not completely understood. There's still a lot of science out there where they're kind of seeing where is this dividing piece where we see that major connection. But what we do know is high levels of estrogen and progesterone, um, for example, like in pregnancy or um, birth control pills would also affect those levels in the skin can actually increase pigmentation. And we mentioned earlier, we looked at the kind of the image of the kind of the body where all of those glands were located. We've also see that the placenta, remember, it takes control of producing estrogen and progesterone. And that's where we see hyperpigmentation coming up. So one of the things um, I also wanted just to kind of briefly touch on is that when we you know, can see this, how does this affect like hair growth? So for example, estrogens um, really actually favor the kind of growing phase or the kind of antigen to telogen phase. So when we think about having an even balanced um, of estrogens through our body, our hair feels definitely like it's growing. It might feel thicker. It might look shinier. Um, and as we age, again, sometimes some people experience like thinning of the hair or hair loss. And um, that can definitely happen as well. So we might see that happening as women age. So if our clients are talking about like definitely hairline, hair feels a little bit thinner, we can associate that a little bit of estrogen. Um, those hormones are definitely changing a bit. Now, I do want to make a, a point that we're not there to be their doctor, right? We're not there to say, oh, okay, you, you're experiencing this, your estrogens must be low. That's not our place. But we can take a look at their consultation card and see like, okay, what age range are they in? Could they be experiencing some of this kind of depletion of estrogens in their body? Um, you know, recommend them to have conversations with their general physician. What we're there to do is make sure we can manage some of these signs that we see happening on the skin, such as aging, fine lines, sensitivity, dryness, hyperpigmentation. That is where we come in to help maintain the really healthy uh, skin during a uh, treatment. And of course, with proper prescribed at-home products. All right. So let's switch away from our steroid hormones and we're gonna head into our thyroid hormones. So the thyroid gland manufactures hormones that control metabolism and growth. One key hormone that's produced by the thyroid and you can definitely see here where the thyroid is located um, into the neck, the thyroid gland, I should say, um, it produces a hormone called thyroxin and thyroxin is what is basically responsible for how um, our skin appears when there are imbalances with our thyroid gland or our thyroid hormone. So here's what we're going to take a look at. Um, and here's some examples. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about um, hypothyroidism or hyper. So two different things. What we're more concerned about is what is happening? What's happening um, with the skin when that works? So let's take a look at our low thyroid hormone first. And that's going to just kind of give us some options of what we might notice um, happening in the skin. Now, I do want to say that this effect of the, the hormone that's released by the thyroid gland, that thyroxin I mentioned, it is can affect the skin, but it also can affect the hair 
and the nails. So there might be some changes that could be fluctuating with that. Again, great to pay attention to that consultation card, especially if your client is on a medication to manage either low or high um, thyroidism. So let's start with low. Low thyroid is going to be causing more of that kind of uh, scale-like thickening, right? Skin that's a little bit more rough and dry to the texture. Um, we can see the skin on the hands and the feet can actually be a little bit thicker, more coarse, more callous. There could be like a little yellowing on the soles of the feet. Think about like where like those heel areas as well. The nails can also be a little bit more brittle. And then the skin, when we are touching the skin for someone who has more of that low thyroid hormone, it feels cool. Sometimes it can feel like a little um, kind of not as, I guess, uh, almost like tacky. And it might feel as if the, the client is, is just feeling like they don't have a lot of circulation going through their body. The hair may change, it could be some thinning, um, alopecia could actually be affected or actually be caused by low thyroidism. And we do notice that there is a little bit more um, decreased sweating. So that's where we see that dryness. So it's weird because the reason I say that is as therapists, we think, okay, well, if I have dry, if I'm touching dry skin, I don't necessarily maybe think of it as have, being, having being cool to the touch. But again, this is, is such a change on how it affects our skin and how it responds. Now, hyperthyroidism, just like the word hyper, too much, right? We have too much of that thyroid um, hormone. And it creates, honestly, like the opposite reaction um, into the skin. We have more of a smoother, more moist skin. Uh, there could be a little bit oilier patches. We might notice like in the T-zone that there could be some oiliness across the forehead as well. Um, the nails might be, you know, easily, you know, breaking. That could be something that happens with that client. They also, their appearance of their skin looks a little bit more flush. Sometimes I, I kind of feel like it has almost like a waxy appearance or a bronze kind of glow to it. Again, this can also, and it's interesting with hyper and hypothyroidism, it can also affect the hair. So as I mentioned, this is a pretty powerful hormone and it can affect more than just the skin. Now with hyperthyroidism, think about that. We're like, it's kind of like it's stimulating. It's causing more overproduction of that thyroxine. And so we're gonna start to notice that it could be increased sweating Maybe the client doesn't want to really have the steamer on. We need to turn the bed heater off. If you guys have a bed warmer, um, maybe we need to make sure the room feels a little bit cooler. So those are really great things for us to just to kind of tune into of how, what, we'll sh what could we see on the skin when we like, right? I keep looking down, like I've got my client right here, looking down and seeing what, okay, what am I noticing during my skin analysis? But more importantly, how do I make changes to my treatment? Okay. So hopefully everyone is doing okay. Um, and I see, thank you Celeste for letting us know about the uh, chat button there as well. And we'll be able to make sure we can go back and get those questions at the end of our course today. So thanks everyone for hanging in there with us. All right, so let's move into talking about another set of hormones and that is going to be our growth hormones. So I'll give you a moment here just to kind of look at the screen and kind of get a little bit of an understanding because there's two types of hormones here that we're going to be speaking about. I want you to notice that there is IGF-1, which is your insulin-like um, growth factor. And then there is HGH, which is your human growth hormone. Now, growth hormones are a relatively, I'd say like a newer a newish area that we are talking in regards to skin. Um, they're responsible, of course, just as they're, as they're listed there as growth hormones, responsible for growth and metabolism. So our growth hormone is going to stimulate uh, cell reproduction, regeneration. Um, but what's interesting, the growth hormone is affected by many factors, including stress, um, exercise, nutrition is a really a big one, and sleep. So if we think about this, 
you know, this human growth hormone, it, it can really be affected by a lot of imbalances um, in our body. The insulin-like growth factor is that's a hormone that's produced actually in the liver and is significant in cell growth and development, particularly in childhood. So if you think about these two hormones, they're really going to be responsible, especially from children, you know, at a very, at a young age, but they actually start to change and surge as, um, as an adolescent mu moves into puberty. So it, basically they are, they kind of play off of each other and they can affect each other. Now, one of the key things I want to highlight here is in response to when it comes to teenage um, acne. So a lot of us maybe have treated a client with teenage acne. Maybe you have someone in your family who's actually being, who's actually going through changes of breakouts in, in their skin and they're in that age, that teenage age range or anywhere between like 11 all the way up to uh, 16, 17, where we see a lot of these changes. So the surge of insulin-like growth factor enc encourages, right? The good thing is it encourages our growth, like our muscles, our ligaments, our bones. Um, but what happens is it starts to peak right at puberty. And that is when usually breakouts and acne are at their worst for some younger adolescents. So it's, it's kind of believed that this peak of IGF-1 in conjunction with testosterone, and of course, you know, we see that dihydrotestosterone, this is like this trifecta during these teenage years and they affect each other and they kind of cause a lot of these changes, these genetic changes in our body and we see it on our skin. So what I mean by that is they start to interact. We see this peak during our teenage years, especially in young boys, um, you know, in that age, in that age range. And what we're noticing is inflammation, higher levels of like oil production. And we might start to see things such as like um, deeper acne lesions that kind of hang around a little bit longer that could be a little bit painful. And then these concentrations can also stimulate even um, insulin. So they might stimulate insulin. They kind of sig they basically signal and, and kind of up kind of uptake that insulin receptor. And we see that th these two are really playing a role in teenage acne. So this is kind of why when we see that, okay, we're seeing an increase in IGF-1 during puberty is acting on the skin. It's increasing uh, sebum production and oil, which causes clogging. We also know that more oil is really going to be, you know, caught there into the follicles. So next thing we see, we see more like P acne is being present who are starting to really feed upon that. Um, basically those dead skin cells and excessive oil. And it's just kind of like this mix. It's really causing a lot of this breakout. So if you think about at that age too, not only is this peaking, but testosterone levels are also at their peak. So that also contributes to more oil production, inflammation in the skin. So it makes sense that we're going to see that there's definitely more breakout happening. Now, we can't really stop all these hormone changes from occurring, but we can definitely treat the acne as well. So we'll be able to help them with their breakouts. And of course, really giving them some you know, advice, solid advice, right, for teenage skin, such as like, don't pick, <laughs> number one, don't pick you know, really cleaning your face morning and night. Um, nutrition is a big one. So there's definitely a lot of information we cover for you in the skin series about dairy. So milk and sugar and IGF-1 and insulin and how that can actually contribute to acne breakout. So I hope you guys sign up for that class because it is amazing. You're going to learn this information and so much more. Okay. So um, as we go move forward, we see, we think about how do, how do hormones start to fluctuate in both our body and our skin? So as we're kind of rounding out um, our presentation today, as I mentioned before, hormones too much, too little can really affect a lot of processes in our body. And more importantly, hormones on the skin can cause oily skin, um, dark spots, 
dry skin, wrinkling, hyperpigmentation, and even excess hair growth. But on a positive note, when they are in balance, they are responsible for a really healthy skin as well. So through a lifetime, these hormones are going to change up and down. We just talked a little bit about our growth hormones and how it kind of really taps into and peaks with that peak of the IGF-1 during puberty. So let's start at the beginning. I think puberty is a great place to be um, to start with this conversation. So during puberty, as previously discussed, androgen hormones um, are going to trigger sebaceous gland growth. They're going to increase a release of sebum. Um, now, the sebum, as I mentioned, is a great source of food for the bacteria on the skin, the, like the excessive bacteria known as P. acnes. So we see this, this high production, um, you know, large amounts of this are going to be affected. And we can see that a little bit differently than adult acne or hormonal acne when it, as in our more adult years, but we see it kind of all over the face forehead, cheeks, chin area, even um, for some, especially for maybe adolescent um, young, young uh, people that I might see like on the back breakouts as well. So these teenagers are experiencing a lot of excessive oil. So it's really going to be important during this time that hygiene is very important, taking care of their skin. And we kind of have to step in, right, as a skin, as a skin coach. And nutrition is also key. So as much as, um, I mean, I love a good burger, French fries and pizza, that actually is a high glycemic diet and it can actually kind of cause an imbalance in cause like an increase in breakout. So when you think about teenage acne now, you're gonna be thinking about it a little bit more differently because there is a reason of why it's definitely called teenage acne or teenage breakouts. Pregnancy, another change that can happen to some of our clients. Now, there are different categories when it comes to changes in the skin on pregnancy. There's definitely like hormone related changes. Um, and there are some that are honestly this very pregnancy specific. But I would say through here, what we're looking at is melasma pigmentation is a, is a key one, right? That irregular brown spots we see on the cheeks, the forehead, the jaw. Um, almost like that butterfly, you may have heard of that, also referred to as chalasma. Um, some clients might also see um, a little bit of the uh, lamia nigra, which is the line on the belly, um, basically from like the belly button down to the pubic bone. Sometimes it will go higher than that, but all this is pigmentation changes. And so again, back to what we talked about this earlier in our course today, we talked about that temporary endocrine organ, the placenta. So it makes sense that we're seeing a lot of these hormonal changes. And of course, a lot of surges in estrogen and progesterone are definitely a key component of that. We are going to see vascular changes in the skin. So with pregnancy, you see an increase, an overabundance of blood supply. So we might notice um, pregnancy glow. It is a real thing. And but also things that they, our clients may not like. Um, like varicose veins or the little spider nevi or telangiectasia or more dilated capillaries. Maybe there's a reddish hue on their skin, a lot of flushing sensitivity. So that's definitely going to be part of that. The glands are affected. And I mean more by, by this, I'm talking about our sebaceous glands. So these are going to definitely cause, can we cause a little bit, maybe some more oil in the skin. Um, where we see some breakouts, congestion in the follicle, comedones, or maybe they haven't experienced before. Now on the flip side, there are some women who may experience dry skin. Everyone's a little bit different. So just to kind of be aware of what are some changes. And of course, stretch marks, connective tissue, all right? We know that that's gonna be a big thing that's happening um, just with the growth of um, the body as well and how it changes. So. These are just some things we might be thinking of. Um, hopefully some of you were able to attend our pregnancy in the skin course, but in the skin series, we dive into this really deeply and it's great information to know. So we've gone through puberty, uh, pregnancy, if that happens uh, for someone, and now we reach perimenopause. 
So as this start, as we start to kind of go into this phase, our estrogen levels begin to drop. And as that drops, consequently, so do, so does our, our collagen. So it can actually decrease up to 30% in the first five years of actually menopause, right? So we think about wrinkles and saggings. This is where a lot of people who have gone through perimenopause and the menopause, and they notice that, wow, you know, my, my skin seems to be changing or sagging rather quickly. When it comes to the levels of estrogen, progesterone, they're just not in balance. We see a lot of um, like vascular activity. Um, we're going to notice that there's a lot of fluid retention, maybe some like swelling, maybe the eyes are a little bit more swollen than normal. They are also noticing um, maybe some bloating is happening. And then we're also seeing a little bit more of an increase when it comes to sensitivity as well. And that's where we see some women who are getting more of that flushing and telling Jetasia might be into their 40s, maybe they never have had it before. And now they're suddenly starting to see it. It's starting to affect it because remember, when our estrogen levels drop, that also is going to affect our skin. And estrogens are also fantastic at keeping that really healthy level of vascular activity. Dehydration, as hormones decline, we see definitely more dryness in the skin. Um, there can be some hormonal breakouts that happen as well. And uh, hot flushes, it definitely is the real thing. And again, this is the lack of the estrogen um, in the body our body's thermostat is just not working properly. So it just kind of like without kind of a notice, it can start to say, you know what? I'm feeling overheated. And it communicates that to the brain and the brain automatically switches on and says, oh, you know what? We're becoming overheated. We need to start perspiring or sweating and causing some flushing. Cortisol actually increases. So that's that stress hormone. And so that is something I think a lot of us, especially during these times, are quite aware of our levels of stress have kind of definitely peaked, but in perimenopause, it can get even higher. Um, and just definitely on top of that, just causes a lot of like unnecessary like changes in our body, but yet it's the way our body and our skin is adapting to those hormonal fluctuations. After perimenopause, of course, now we are in menopause. So once women reach this area, hormone levels have dropped significantly and they pretty much will remain low for the remainder of life. So women all over the world um, experience menopause in different, I'd say different levels. Some women will notice it more when it comes to changes in their skin or in their mood or into their energy levels. As we can see, you know, we've definitely talked about estrogens being made in the ovaries primarily, but after menopause, it's interesting, the skin actually kind of takes over and the majority of estrogens then are made um, from the skin. So it's quite fascinating. You know, we, our skin is the largest organ of our body and it is always monitoring these different changes and fluctuations through life. So we have decreased estrogen, which means decreased collagen and elastin. Um, it's basically a decrease in the collagen is roughly about 2% per postmenopausal year and can kind of continue based upon that. Now, some women go on to what's known as HRT or hormone replacement therapy, but again, that is for their doctor to decide. Um, depending on the kind of vast or drastic changes that they're experiencing. experiencing. Um, we also know that, you know, with this drop, there's a little bit more like rigidness to the skin. There's lower hydration levels, moisture levels. And of course, we are also going to notice that there's a delayed amount of wound healing. So because again, lower levels of estrogen, collagen decreases, and so it might take longer for things to actually heal, including deep acne lesions. And then uneven pigmentation. The melanocyte cells uh, decrease in density from about 10 to 20% per decade. And as we start to age, we're definitely seeing a lot of this mottled skin, 
uneven pigmentation and odd areas of the face, even the backs of the hands. So sunscreen SPF, of course, is paramount throughout our entire life, but this is definitely so important right now because our skin is, is so susceptible. So we've really you know, gone through today how hormones um, affect the skin and whether they come from the brain, the thyroid, the ovaries, the testes. The most important thing is balance. And the human skin is definitely been classically targeted uh, for several hormones. But we know, in fact, that not only does our endocrine um, system you know, regulate these uh, glands and the hormones that are released, but our skin, in fact, is an endocrine organ. So our hormones can actually be affected by different things like enzymes um, in our body and skin, like 5 alpha reductase, our diet, our environment, or what I would call it, our exposome. All of that can definitely be affected. And even our stress and our mood. So you know, we think about this is that we just want to think about how can we keep that balance and you know, physically nutrition, exercise, stress reducing steps are going to be key for our clients as they're going through these different changes and fluctuations of life. But it's also going to be really important for us as skin therapists to recognize some of the changes on the skin so we can manage them with proper treatments, ingredients, and also at home care. So I hope everyone has enjoyed this overview of hormones and how they affect the skin today. I'm going to uh, hand it back over to Celeste. I know we have some questions, but I, again, just want to thank you so much for, you know, having me in your home, your office, um, and spending some time with me today and, and talking about such an interesting subject. And we hope to see you soon at our next IDI course. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, some really <clears throat> great information. And uh, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, we've realized that hormones are just such a big part of our lives. Yeah. And yes. I think that our ability to give this information over to our clients with whatever stage of life they're in, you know, whether it be teen hormones or, you know, menopausal hormones where it's changing your, you know, skin's you know, dryness levels and all those great things. It's just, it's, it's such a nice way to support our clients. So thank you so much for the information. So you're welcome. We, we do have some really great questions. Okay. Um, let's start with Linda. So, and I know this was a part of the, of the uh, presentation. So are those transitions taking androgens? So I'm trying to remember where that was. So if you want to look through there and then I'm going to find another one, maybe that, um, or if Linda, if you want to maybe give more of a specification of where you saw that, that would be perfect. Okay. So why we, why we do that? We can go ahead and keep yep, I'm kind exactly. of looking at the questions with you. Okay, so would we then attribute descended capillaries to lack of estrogen? Are these inherited? Okay, um, what well, all depends on, um, the key thing is going to be depending on that age range. So we can't, again, as I mentioned, we can't necessarily come in and say, yes, because you have dilated capillaries, your estrogen levels must be off, right? So that's something that if you see someone who is, you know, maybe just now experiencing um, higher levels of telangiectasia, they've never noticed it before, and they're like in their 40s, um, in their 50s and 60s, and then there's definitely probably some uh, significance into some hormonal changes um, in their body. But again, if that client is predisposed to rosacea, if rosacea is actually, um, you know, something that is genetically linked into their family, mm -hmm. or they've been diagnosed with that from a dermatologist or a doctor. I mean, there are also those changes. So it, it really just depends on the person. Perfect. Uh, great question here. It's uh, do hormones have an effect on muscly eczema, psoriasis, or dermatitis flare ups specifically during that perimenopausal menopause uh, timeframe? 
Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, when we see, when we see definitely a, for women, especially, I'll go to that level first. Mm -hmm. Um, what science is showing us and from the research that we've done and in, in presenting this course is that when we see a change in those estrogen levels and like definitely, you know, peak kind of plummeting, I shouldn't say they're not peaking, but they're plummeting, they're getting lower. Um, it actually causes more sensitivity. So what happens is that we're going to notice, and especially in a perimenopausal, I'll go with that one first, is that they may be easily, your skin might be easily activated um, and triggered by chemicals, diet, maybe something kind of just triggers it more, like even like washing the hands, um, using a new body soap. If they're already experiencing eczema or psoriasis flare-ups, so again, as they age, um, and as the body definitely lowers those estrogen levels, we start to see the skin is more sensitive and it can be a little bit more finicky. <laughs> it right. likes to be a little bit more reactive um, right. on that. Now, when it comes to our, as, as women who are going through a, like a menstrual cycle, yeah, definitely. And that's something we cover the whole kind of what I call cyclical effect effects on the skin. And we cover that quite in depth in the skin series course. So there are other hormones that are going to be released. I know they just keep, it just keeps just coming, keep coming. <laughs> right? So we've got luteinizing hormone or, you know, our uh, follicle stimulating hormone. And we see definitely some peaks, especially like progesterone that is going to be peaking at different times. And so just as like, um, you might be a little bit more sensitive like before and kind of like maybe 12 days into uh, ovulation that can definitely cause a heightened level of sensitivity in the skin and cause some flare-ups as well. So hopefully I answered both of those, whether yeah. menstrual or perimenopausal or menopausal. Yeah. And, I, and it, it, it makes very big, you know, great sense is like everything is, con you know, connected within your body. So there's like, you know, you have those fluctuations in hormones, which then affects how your skin reacts to things. So right, right. Very, uh, very, inf uh, very informative. <laughs> um, you know, it, this is actually a great question from Anne. Is hormonal acne more common with women or do men get acne as they age as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I would say, yes, definitely. I would say more common and more noticeable uh, with women because of definitely the different changes and surges of like hormones in their body. We also know that adult women are under, uh, usually a little bit more, uh, stress. So let's think about cortisol, those adrenal glands and everything right here around the jawline mm -hmm. is going to be, um, definitely affected. It's not to say that men could not necessarily have hormonal um, acne, and this depends if there is a surge or a change in, a, say, like testosterone um, mm -hmm. in in their in their body. But you know, you're going to hear more and more. It's really more women who are going to be complaining of that, um, especially just due to you know stress levels, uh, the way that the um, that actually kind of targets our sebaceous glands revs those up. And then also it increases, um, sensitivity and inflammation. So then we have inflammation Now we have these inflammatory papules in the skin. So it just kind of starts this like cycle. And on top of that, our wound healing mm. is delayed because we are actually are, you know, getting a little bit, um, older as well. Right. Right. And I, or I, I like to say more experience, more not older, experience. <laughs> like a fine wine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and then one last one, because I think this affects a lot of people is why do women seem to get more breakouts when working out? Uh, they feel like they stay clear, you know, most of the time, but then when they start running and they start doing more things, more active lifestyle mm -hmm. seems to actually break them out more. Um, okay. And I think it's from Lisa, right? Mm -hmm. okay. so I'm reading her question here. And even though I keep my skin clean, yes, definitely. Um, well, it, it all depends to one thing and just it's a couple of things. I'm going to put it into like a couple categories. So one, if, if you've not been super active, right. And you, maybe you haven't been working out for a while and suddenly you start doing it, right. You start doing more exercise, maybe doing more like 
high intensity mm -hmm. exercise, you're sweating more, you're eating better, your body naturally in general is going to start purging and it's going to start getting mm -hmm. rid of like excessive oil and, you know, build up and debris, everything that has just kind of sitting there being sedentary. Right. right? So we might start to see that like across the forehead uh, for women, especially along the jawline, maybe across the chest or the back. Mm -hmm. Cause it's just kind of, basically it's almost resetting itself. The other thing too, is that some people are actually, their skin is just more predisposed to really being sensitive to excessive oil and sweat. Um, that kind of combination of it. Mm -hmm. Um, we get take a, we need to keep a, take a look at some people will need to say, um, you know, I need actually need to clean this. And I'm one of them. I actually have to make sure my skin is clean before I work out. And then after I work out, I'm like cleaning my skin again. So it's just because again, there's a lot of that sweat and sebum is just really building up. So as far as really scientifically pinpointing it, why it's definitely happening with women in particular, Again, we have to take a look at the age range. We have to take mm -hmm. a look at their current health, their lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, stress levels. So again, if you've been working out for a continuous period of time and you're still noticing I'm getting like breakouts on my chest or my back, right. um, it, it sounds simple, but you can even take a look at contributing to that to like what you're wearing. So sports bras, tank tops, uh, acne coming from friction. Mm -hmm. um, that's another key thing. So we have to kind of start what I normally do with, you know, my clients who are experiencing that during breakouts, uh, breakouts during working out, we start to eliminate, right. And we start to see what, what's actually happening. So it's a bigger process than actually mm -hmm. kind of just saying, yes, that's the one answer for it. It varies. Yeah. Uh, so we are at our time, but don't worry, everyone. I know there's some really great questions still in Q&A. So what we're gonna do is Beth and I are gonna take those and we'll put them into a doc that we'll then send out to you next week to have some follow-up. Just remember, you can actually find this webisode. If there were certain things that you wanted maybe to hear again, we will have this webisode up on dermalinstitute.com next week. So it will be under webisodes when you're going to uh, look for it. And right. then we do have a um, IDA stream streaming skin series, Hormones in the Skin, coming up in March. And that's on March 29th out of our Los Angeles location. But streaming, you can take it from anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that will be um, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific, Pacific Standard Time. So be on the lookout for that. You can also book that through dermalinstitute.com under book now. So we do have those great resources on top of the, um, the Q and a that we'll do a follow up on. So we greatly right. appreciate all of your time. Thank you, Beth. This was a jam packed session. Yeah. <laughs> always, right. It's easy yes. to start just talking about a, a, a topic that you're very keen on. So thank you so much for all the information. Everyone have a great day. Stay safe. Um, and just before we go, we do obviously have our Instagram live today that Beth and yes, I we do. do. And we're talking about peels, which is a very fun subject, very yeah. interesting, and kind of also goes along with what we're talking about with how you may do certain peels on different times of people's lives. So some really informational stuff. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Beth. You're and very welcome. Thank you, everybody. Time. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Everyone. See you soon.